um, is again, welcome everyone to our mental health webinar. We are joined by some amazing, amazing women this evening who all specialize in uh, perinatal mood and anxiety disorders. And that is what we're going to be talking about this evening. And so what I would love to do um, is have each of the panelists introduce themselves and tell us a little bit about themselves, and then we will dive into some questions. So um, Dr. Tracy, we might start with you. Absolutely. Thank you so much for joining us tonight and for having me here. I'm so excited for our chat. I am Dr. Tracy Dalgleish. I'm a psychologist and couples therapist here in Ottawa. And I'm also the owner of the mental health clinic that I'm actually in my office right now, Integrated Wellness. And my work is in terms of working with mothers started before I became a mother, but I think I be became much more appreciative of the challenges that couples and mothers and parents in general experience once I became a mother to two young children. So they're at home being put to bed tonight so that I can do this work. Amazing. Fantastic. Thank you. And I think we have some people joining us from Canada as well, which is fantastic. Um, and I will move on to Paige. Paige. Well, thank you so much, Natalie, for having me here. It's really exciting to be a part of this NANIT event. Uh, my name is Paige Bellenbaum, and I am the founding director of an organization called the Motherhood Center located in New York City. Uh, we are a treatment facility that provides support and clinical care to pregnant and postpartum women experiencing PMATs. And we do it through a number of different uh, modalities um, and ways, depending on how severe a new or expecting mother or birthing parent might be experiencing PMAD symptoms. We have support groups, outpatient treatment with therapists and reproductive psychiatrists, and a very special day program uh, for new and expecting moms that are having a hard time caring for themselves and their babies. Amazing. Amazing. Thank you. Um, and Dr. Cassidy. Hello, I'm Dr. Cassidy Freitas. I'm a licensed marriage and family therapist and a mom to three. Um, I have a 10 year old, a seven year old and a one almost two year old. And I have a private practice here in San Diego, California where I work with expecting and postpartum moms, partners and their families. Amazing, amazing, thank you. Um, and Dr. Alice. Yes. Hi, um, I'm Dr. Alice Pickering. I'm a licensed clinical psychologist in Arizona, um, and I have a private practice that is strictly telehealth, and we offer um, telehealth services in 29 different states in the U.S. Um, yeah, yeah, it's great. And I work primarily with um, expecting and postpartum parents, um, women, and female professionals. And so, um, yeah, that's the bulk of what I do. Okay, fantastic. I love it. Thank you so much. Uh, and so I'm actually going to jump right in. Um, and I'm going to actually start with you, Paige. And I'm wondering if you can tell me, what is a PMAD? Ah, what is a PMAD? That acronym that none of us really love, but it's what we have. <laughs> and it stands for Perinatal Mood and Anxiety Disorders. I always like to say, aka postpartum depression or the postpartum. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's what most of us, uh, it's what most people, those of us who are familiar with maternal mental health know of um, is postpartum depression, but actually PMADs are an umbrella uh, that sit above a number of different diagnoses that impact both pregnant and postpartum women. Uh, and so this includes depression, anxiety, obsessive compulsive disorder, post-traumatic stress disorder, bipolar disorder, and in rare but very serious instances, postpartum psychosis. Mm -hmm. And the reason why it's called perinatal is because these symptoms and diagnoses can originate at any point during pregnancy and up to one year postpartum. And in fact, although we do call it postpartum depression, what a lot of people don't realize is that 50% of all PMADs actually originate during pregnancy. So mm -hmm. Can happen in that entire span. Yep. Um, and so, so thank you for that. Um, and can you tell us? And I think a lot of people really want 
to know this, you know, how do people know the difference between, or you know, how do they know the difference between baby blues and a PMAD? And so when, and when is it, and so, and you know, and this is sort of a bigger question that we can also get to is, you know, when do we, you know, when would we recommend that they, you know, talk to someone about it or seek treatment for, for something? So if you could answer that first bit, that would be fantastic. So how do we know the difference between, you know, what is baby blues and what may, you know, may develop into a PMAD? Well, I'm going to add an extra category to that. What's the yeah. difference between baby blues and a PMAD? And what's the difference um, of normal and typical anxiety that originates mm -hmm. from a pandemic? Um, yeah. Because right. what I will say, Natalie, is that, you know, women are experiencing PMADs at exponential rates as a direct result mm -hmm. of the isolation, lack of social support, and managing even higher levels of stress during the pandemic. So I throw that in there um, because it is a new category in and of itself. But to answer your question, so the baby blues is something that impacts anywhere from 60 to 80 percent of all new mothers, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, after you have a baby, for those of you who have or about to, uh, your hormones are doing backflips and gymnastics of all kinds of sorts within your body. Um, and your emotions are, um, are, are a sea of, of waves and, and flatness. And oftentimes women will feel weepy. They'll feel irritable. They'll feel overwhelmed, anxious, um, exhausted, right? These are very common ways to feel in the immediate postpartum. And baby blues usually last on average anywhere for a couple of days up until two weeks, right? 14 days. <clears throat> when we start to think that something else might be at play is if those feelings of sadness, irritability, anxiety, if they continue past the two week mark mm -hmm. and if they become more intense, right? And so, you know, a lot of women will say like, how do I know exactly if I have a PMAD? Well, there are screening instruments out there like the EPDS that can help determine whether or not a woman might be experiencing postpartum depression. But I would say the response is actually quite simple, right? We all have a baseline and that's like where we normally are at. It's how we experience the world when we're in our, in our base place. Mm -hmm. um, so I will oftentimes ask women in the perinatal period, if you were to rate yourself, how far away are you from your baseline right now? Are you a little bit above it? Are you way above it, right? How much of your day are you feeling anxious, depressed, overwhelmed? Is it a little bit or is it most of the day, almost all the time, right? And these are ways that we can start to gauge how much distress is this woman actually in? And what really matters is how much distress she identifies for herself, right? If she's having a hard time making it through the day, completing tasks, Tasks, you know, having a hard time sleeping, eating because her anxiety is so intense, or having scary intrusive thoughts of harm coming to the baby. These are all very, um, very kind of basic and common experiences that women have in the perinatal period that suggest that they might be experiencing a PMAD. Yeah. Okay. Fantastic. Thank you, Paige. Um, I would love to add to that. Sorry to interrupt. Yeah. I'd love to add to Sorry. that because sometimes we don't look at the full, the picture of all of what's happening in our life, right? So Paige, I want to add to that, that when we start experiencing difficulties in our relationships, in our ability to connect with other people in our life, that's also a good indicator if our functioning is impaired in that way, that it's time to reach out for someone that we might be struggling with something. Yeah, I love that. I love that, Tracy. Thank you. Um, and Dr. Cassidy, tell me, can you tell me a little bit about um, when are you typically diagnosing your patients? As in, a, what um, you know, are, are they, you know, are they pregnant? Have they just given birth? Are they have they got? Are they three months postpartum? Um, you know, when's the most most likely time that you're going to be seeing patients? You know. The answer is is an, is unfortunate. Is that a lot of times when people when folks come in, it's at a point where they're they're really really struggling. Mm -hmm. um, there's a, the, the folks that do are proactive and will come while they're expecting. Um, maybe they're experiencing symptoms, or maybe they have a history and they're being proactive. But a lot of times what I see is folks were like, they're just waiting for that milestone. Maybe just once the baby starts sleeping through the night, or maybe once we hit this one milestone around, you know, feeding baby, then, 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 I'll, then it'll be better. And they yeah. wait. 
and they wait and they wait. And if people take anything from this talk, I want them to not wait, right? I want them to not wait till they're at the point where it's impacting their relationships and their functioning. And they just- so Who do they reach out to? Yeah, that's a great question. So a lot of times um, folks will be recommended to go to Postpartum Support International, which has an amazing directory. And I 100% recommend their directory. Um, but a lot of times people will, will say, well, gosh, this is a big list. I don't even know where to start. So some other suggestions of where we can start is identifying um, a provider that you trust that might be your OBGYN or pediatrician, mm -hmm. but it might be a lactation consultant or a doula or an acupuncturist. Or maybe there is that friend that you really know you can trust with this part of yourself and open yeah. up that vulnerability or a family member that you really do feel like you can open up to. And asking that provider, hey, I'm struggling, do you have any referrals? Or asking that friend or family member, hey, I'm struggling, I really wanna get support, can you help me take some of these steps because I feel really overwhelmed. So that kind of bridge to get to that, you know, directory of referrals can be really helpful. Yeah. I, I like to that. remind people to knock twice. So if the first provider says, no, it's probably just baby blues. You're fine. Just start going out for walks more with baby or once baby starts sleeping, I always like to encourage people knock again, find another provider to talk to, or then reach out to a therapist. You can self-refer to a therapist. You don't need to have a referral from a primary care provider. Love that Tracy. Yeah, That's a I, really, really good tip. I'd like Alice, to, um, yeah, I'd like to kind of echo what Dr. Cassidy had shared, which was um, don't delay, right? I've never had a mom that said, um, you know, I wish I would have waited longer. If anything, it's, gosh, I wish I would have come to see you much sooner. I wish I didn't have to be, you know, so upset or so down and so anxious to, to get to this place where, you know, I needed point, help. To that point, Alice, can you sort of anecdotally sort of tell us, you know, what, what can happen if someone seeks treatment early versus seeking treatment later? Yes. So it, I think obviously it varies, but um, oftentimes what I've seen, I've, I've had some few proactive moms who are pregnant who they've had a history of perhaps anxiety before and they've noticed like, okay, my anxiety is ramping up. I'm having some fears around birth and labor. And, and so they'll discuss and share those things. And um, I find that as they transition postpartum, they're usually about like four to six weeks and they're, you know, they're like, Hey, like I'm doing pretty good. I feel good. Or a mom will start, you know, a medication and she starts therapy and she's in a great place. Um, you know, I think she's prepared, um, practically, emotionally, and kind of touched on some of those ways that you can proactively set yourself up for some success, so to speak, postpartum. And so, um, from what I find is they're gener generally in, in, in therapy a little bit shorter, but I think that also varies though, just from person to person and circumstance, um, you know, and, and personal preference. Yeah, sure. Sure. Um, and the other thing that I wanted to mention that we, that had come up, that has come up in a recent survey that we did at Nanit, um, is we saw that the rates of postpartum anxiety of people who had been diagnosed with postpartum anxiety was actually a lot higher than the, the, um, the proportion of people who had been diagnosed with postpartum depression. And postpartum anxiety is not something that we talk about as much as postpartum depression. And so I wondered if you may be able to speak to that and I'm opening it up to all of you. So one of you can, you know, to, to jump in, to think about what, what is the difference between postpartum anxiety and postpartum depression? And how do we, how do we recognize those different, you know, different symptoms between the two? Cassidy, do you want to jump in there? Pages, oh, Paige, you were on mute. Page. Sorry, I was on mute. I would say postpartum anxiety and depression are best friends. They hang out a lot together. They have a high comorbidity rate. Mm -hmm. um, and what we oftentimes see is that because an anxious symptoms um, are more active, that um, that that the, the symptoms and the diagnosis might lead with anxiety. And mm -hmm. then in treatment, what we oftentimes see is once we're able to attack and treat the anxiety and put it at bay, that's when we discover the depression that lurks beneath it. Yeah. Um, but you know, just some some very basic 
things that delineate between the two. And to your point, and 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 drawing it back to what I said initially about the pandemic, like you know, anxiety is 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 very very prevalent. Um, and so you know, anxiety about the baby's sleeping, eating, gaining weight. Um, checking to see if the baby's breathing, uh, you know, feeling like your mind is a hamster wheel and it just keeps racing and you can't turn it off and it keeps you up at night. Um, you know, these are some of the symptoms that, that are more closely linked with anxiety, but I think oftentimes get dismissed because as new mothers, as mothers, we are anxious. We want what's best for our babies, our, our little infants and our children. And so sometimes it can be hard to tell, is this just being a normal new mom? Or is this something more? Yeah, yeah. Um, I think that's a really that's a really great point. Um, and thinking about new parenthood, I just wanted to ask Tracy. You know, to, uh, you know, we know that how you know you you are your main you know area of expertise and focus is relationships. Um, and you know, and most of our parents are in um, you know are you in relationships. And I would love you to talk to how relationships change when you have a baby and what is what is normal you know what can people expect and what you know when does it ever get back to normal or is it always just different you know so I would love you to talk a little bit to you know how relationships change when you have a baby it, it would be great to really shift our mentality of that instead of trying to go back to how we were we're going to keep growing and evolving as two different yes people. I love it yeah Let's normalize how our relationships change once you bring in a dependent on you. And that is, we've seen the research, 67% of people experience decreases in their relationship satisfaction in the first three years of having a child. So we need to expect that our relationship is going to change. There are increased demands on you as a person, for both of you as a partnership, things becomes more transactional. You don't have that free time to be spontaneous or to sit on the couch and connect without being pulled away. There's less you time. So it's harder to be able to look after you. And we know that when we fill up our own cup, then we have something to give to our partners. And then, I mean, it's inevitable to say that then sex also becomes on the back burner. I like to remind people that this is a season in their relationship and we want to make sure that we continue to turn towards our partner rather than turning away from them, staying in our phones, shutting down, not communicating our needs. It's a really difficult time. Yeah, totally. Um, and, and to that point, so thinking about this, you know, this partnership and growing together, um, what do you do if, you notice if you're starting to notice symptoms of, you know, uh, postpartum depression or postpartum anxiety in your partner, and how do you, how do you suggest people um, deal with that, or you know, how do they sort of address it? A address it, or then B, you know, help help their partner seek treatment. I think the more forthcoming we can be about talking about what we're experiencing or what we're seeing is one of the most important things. So instead of sort of sidestepping it or coming up with some kind of language around it, just being able to say, hey, I've noticed that you haven't quite seen like yourself. How are things going for you? How are you doing? And really carving out that space to hear what your partner has to say and to also encourage going to, to speak to someone, normalizing yeah. that more and more partners are needing to get support, particularly as Paige has already mentioned, the pandemic has been incredibly hard on parents, that if we could normalize that piece and be able to encourage our partners to reach for help, it'd be really important. Dr. Cassidy, I know you have more to talk about this because you talk about this a lot as well. Yeah, I was just gonna talk, mention the non-birthing partner really quick. Um, from our own personal experience, this was almost 11 years ago and then ended up being the muse for a lot of the research that I've done. My husband was experiencing postpartum depression. I didn't know it at the time. We didn't have a name for it. We now know that around 10%, at least what's reported of dads, um, non-birthing partners, or is, we have, don't have as much research for same-sex couples, but um, I know that dads, the number is one in 10, um, are at risk for postpartum depression. And my husband experienced it. And the symptoms looked not like what you'd expect with depression. He wasn't weepy, but he was irritable and there was a lot of avoidant behaviors and he didn't seem like himself. Mm -hmm. I was experiencing postpartum anxiety. And as Dr. Tracy shared, 
once I was able to kind of embrace my own vulnerability and share with him like, hey, these are some of the ways in which I'm struggling. These are some of the thoughts that I'm having and I wanna take them out of my head and share them with you. And I, I think I need to talk to someone. Um, I would love it if you'd come with me. Um, and through that, it took us time to get there, but through that bridge, we were able to kind of also access what was going on for him internally, which was depression. Um, and it just looked a little bit different for him. Yeah, I think that's a, a really, it's a lovely, a lovely story and a really great point, Cassidy, that it's not just moms who are, you know, who are suffering from, you know, from postpartum depression and postpartum anxiety. There's a lot of dads out there who are also suffering. Um, and, and we actually published published research around um, rates of postpartum depression in dads. And it was exactly around that. It was around one in 10. Um, and, you know, so I think it's something that we really need to be aware of, not just for our for ourselves as mothers, but also for, you know, for, uh, for the, the, uh, for our partners as well. I think it's a, a really great point. Um, and so Alice, tell mm -hmm. us, have you got any, I would love to hear your top three, top five tips for, you know, for, for new parents in, um, thinking about other than you know other than yeah, the you know traditional therapy or you know um you know medication i would love your sort of top tips of additional things that people could try to help relieve any of their you know any of their anxiety or depression symptoms yes i think um especially during the pandemic it has been so difficult to access some of the social supports, mm -hmm. which I believe are absolutely critical, especially during such a vulnerable time. Um, um, yeah. And, and so I definitely recommend um, accessing some of that emotional and social support, um, whether that's through, you know, an online support group, postpartum international, postpartum support international offers a ton of free postpartum support groups. Um, and I think getting plugged in and connected with some local groups in your community that may be happening, um, you know, I know a way to find those too is through your pediatrician or your OBGYN. Sometimes if you're birthing at a hospital um, or even like a birthing center, they host some groups. Um, and so I think that is probably my biggest recommendation is getting that social and emotional support. Um, in, in, in the ways that, that help and benefit you. Uh, my other, I think that's up there on the top is kind of refraining from social media use because I think, yeah. um, you know, or, or just taking that kind of gentle step back from social media, from Facebook, from Instagram, um, and, and again, going to those, you know, genuine supports because when you're on social media, everybody and everything looks so picture perfect and beautiful and, you know, you start to compare yourself to that unknowingly you compare yourself to that. And, you know, you start to, to question even more, well, well, why isn't my baby sleeping or what are they doing differently? How come they're doing it this way? How come they're doing it that way? And um, I, I think we've come a long way on social media in terms of vulnerability, but you're not going to get that same level of vulnerability on Instagram, scrolling through somebody's feed as you would in you know, with a close friend or some type of kind of smaller support circle or, or group. Um, so I, I don't know if anybody has anything to chime in on that, but um, I, I love everything that you're saying. I think it's so important, um, Dr. Alice. And I would say that something I would add in there um, is talking about sleep. Um, one of the first things that I'll ask new parents when they're coming in is about sleep and they have newborn there. You're going to have levels of sleep, de sleep deprivation, right? I noticed in the Q and a that Ashley had shared that she was having difficulty sleeping, eating, hearing, hearing things, right. Having those sort of harmful thoughts first, you're so not alone, but we don't need to just like white knuckle through this, right? So finding ways that we can actually even regardless of if your baby's sleeping through the night, finding ways to get restorative rest, like even if it's like a four to five hour stretch. So how can we get that kind, how can we get restorative rest and get sleep so that you can actually have the cognitive functioning, right? To even begin to take some of the steps to address the anxiety or the depression or to access the support. Um, 
And, and I think that feeding definitely plays into this too, right? Because if you are the, the birthing parent, you're maybe navigating breastfeeding, you're worried about potentially your supply, um, the pressure of it's all on you. And, and I know that um, Paige also has, has some, some thoughts here that she could share around navigating um, that sort of like breast is best mentality and that kind of pressure that we, that we put on ourselves. And so I'd love to pass it to you in, in a second, Paige. I think that just in terms of the restorative rest, okay, how do we do this? You know, if you are comfortable with having people come into your home, and if you don't, then between you and your partner, finding a way for you to get four to five hour stretches um, that might look like putting earplugs in and an eye mask on and being in a separate room while somebody else is um, feeding your baby, whether that's a bottle that's pumped milk or you begin to supplement with formula because you getting sleep and your mental health is absolutely beneficial for you and your baby. Um, and, or um, I know that for some people they will um, have a postpartum doula that can come in or a family member. There was no other time in my life that my mother-in-law slept in my, in my bedroom with me and my husband, <laughs> but when we had a baby, she did. And it was, um, so helpful even just to have that kind of routine of knowing the day that she was going to come so that because both him and I were struggling that both of us could get that restorative rest, um, while she took care of the baby. And when I was still navigating, trying to establish my milk supply and, um, and if that is important for some, for some folks, what she would do is she'd bring the baby to me. Um, I would be like half asleep side on my side, feeding the baby. My eyes were still closed. She would take the baby. Once we were done, she'd burp. I put the, you know, earplugs back in the eye mask back on. She would burp, she would swaddle, she'd get the baby back down. So that I just had that nighttime support. Um, that sleep is so, so critical. Yeah. And, and I'm just going to jump in for one second before we get to Paige. Um, but, you know, we know that sleep deprivation is going to exacerbate symptoms, these, these PMAD symptoms. And so it's so vitally important that you um, not only have that that block of sleep, but actually plan for it and talk to your partner together about how you can plan for that. To, to both have, if you possibly can, that block of sleep and really and really prioritizing it, you know, and I know at the end of the day, you know, the day is very, very long with the baby. And at the end of the day, all you want to do is, you know, have some time for yourself, um, for, for a lot of people. But I want you to know that if prioritizing this block of sleep may mean that you get to sleep, you know, right after the baby goes to sleep, but know that this is going to be a very, very, you know, short period of time. It's not that we're suggesting that you, you know, go to bed at 8 p.m. for the next six months. It's literally, you know, for a period of weeks as you, you know, as your baby then starts to consolidate sleep and, you know, you can naturally get these get these longer blocks of sleep. But thinking about talking to your partner about making sleep a priority for, you know, for the two of you, um, I think can can be incredibly, incredibly helpful. And it can be a really hard conversation to have, you know, um, and, you know, and a lot of people find it difficult to have that conversation about prioritizing, you know, their own sleep, you know, a lot, a lot of women think that they need to be sort of on call 24 hours a day in case the baby needs them. Um, but, you know, your sleep is just so incredibly important. I would love to just sort of stress how, how, you know, how much I would love you to just think about, talking to your partner about, you know, prioritizing that, that block of sleep for each of you. Sorry, Paige. I briefly, I, I briefly want to just chime in with that because I think there's such a tendency for, uh, you know, the individual, at least here in the U S when you're on maternity leave, right. Or you take some time off, there's a tendency to really minimize the role that is, um, Oh, we lost Alice. Sorry about that. Okay, we'll get back to Alice, but we'll hand over to Paige. Um, well, I wanted to actually connect to something that Dr. Alice said, um, and also what Dr. Cassidy said. You know, Dr. Alice was talking about social media and the role that it plays, and how it really can be detrimental um, exposure for us um, as as new and expecting mothers. And you know, I, I talk a lot about how we live in this 
in this um, society that really glamorizes and romanticizes motherhood, right? We are spoon fed this depiction of like this blissful, amazing, wonderful, it's the best thing that ever happened to me. Pregnancy has me feeling glowing, filled with energy. I'm so happy the baby here is here. It's unconditionally wonderful. Like, and we see it on social media. We see it on baby products. We see it everywhere. It's the stories our friends tell, right? And so when we do become a mother, and we don't have those experiences, right? Which most people don't, let's be real. There's probably a handful of women out there that have given birth that do feel that way, but I would venture to believe the, the rest of the majority of them would say it's really, really hard. It's the hardest thing I've ever done. Mm -hmm. um, and because we, can, we are constantly comparing ourselves to other people and what we see and what we hear, it can be such a, 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 a creator of guilt and shame mm -hmm. that we feel about ourselves and our, old, and our own ability to mother this new person, this new baby. Um, and there are so, there's so much pressure out there that's deeply rooted in the shoulds and supposed tos, right? Mm -hmm. I, I, oftentimes we'll challenge you moms, like catch yourself, right? When you're thinking, how many times is it a should or I'm a supposed to, I've done that, right? How often are you finding fault in yourself or feeling like a failure because you're comparing yourselves to this perfectionist definition of motherhood that really doesn't exist. And, and I weave the breastfeeding component and into this because, you know, I often, when I talk about breastfeeding, you know, it's like I say that the pendulum has swung, right? When I was growing up, um, everybody was formula fed and I'll oftentimes ask a room full of women um, that are my age or younger, how many were formula fed? Most people raise their hands and I will say, look, we turned out fine, right? Like we're good, I'm smart, I started a business. Like, you know, we're all, we're all intelligent here. Um, and, and the pendulum has shifted all the way over to this breast is best movement. And this is not in any way, shape or form to be anything but supportive of breastfeeding, 100%. For women that are able to do it, that enjoy it. It is a wonderful thing. It is healthy for your baby. It's a bonding experience. And there's a lot of people who can't breastfeed or choose not to breastfeed. And that is okay. Um, and one of the things that's happening right now with the formula shortage, which is all around us, which is just a national crisis. And I, I, I just can't, we could do a whole other conversation on that, is that a lot of people have been using this as even more of a pressure point for women to breastfeed. Mm -hmm. And that is really painful because, you know, oftentimes women can't and they feel so bad about it, right? They have undersupply issues, cracked nipples, it's painful. Their baby was in the NICU and their milk didn't come in. Um, and so, you know, I get pushed back on the fed is best piece, but like, it's really okay. However you choose to feed your baby, whatever works for you is the right choice. I love that page. Thank you for, thank you for um, saying that. Um, does anyone else have anything to add on, on that? I, I'd love to add this piece around social media is that because of this swinging and we can sometimes get into this information overload and we can become almost paralyzed with the information coming in. And again, as Paige is saying, to get into these shouldings and I have tos and musts, and it's okay to take that step back. And part of motherhood and parenthood is learning to listen inward to what feels good for us, not what's working for other people, but what's going to work for us. And Dr. Natalie, we had talked about this earlier today in terms of this all or nothing thinking that comes along with depression and anxiety or the other unhelpful thinking patterns we can get stuck in and they can get really sticky for us. And yep. so making sure we're finding gray areas to live in and areas that feel good for us mixed with a lot of compassion, because this is an incredibly hard season in someone's life. Yeah, that's a really, a really lovely point, Tracy. Um, and in terms of, um, you know, thinking about the, the supporting partner or the non-birthing partner, um, how do you, how do you um, how do you talk to them about what are, what are the best ways that a, a, a you know non-birthing partner can support their 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 new mother? Hmm. 
where to start? Dr. Cassidy, I want to pass that one to you first. <laughs> yeah. So if, you know, I think it, it's super important. We've kind of named this, um, but if one partner is, one parent is struggling, um, research has shown that it's also very likely that the other partner is going to be struggling as well. There's a correlation there. There's risk factors there. And so you potentially have two parents who are, are potentially struggling. Um, and, and Dr. Tracy, you know, shared earlier about, you know, the importance of, and that's so scary, but like of vulnerability, right? Which is taking that meaningful risk of us of opening ourselves, whether we're struggling or we see our partner struggling and saying, I, I don't feel like myself or you don't seem like yourself. And I think then once we kind of make that bridge, right, we, we kind of take that meaningful risk of opening up to each other, then, then it gets to the, okay, well, what, what can we actually do? And I think a lot of the things that we've talked about thus far can, can be ways in which someone can come in and support, whether it's sleep. All right, I'm going to take the lead on us trying to make, come up with a plan for how to get you a chunk of sleep at night or for how us to get sleep here at night. Or maybe it's, there's, there's some boundary stuff going on. There's support system that might not be as supportive, right? Or boundaries that we need to be putting in place. And I can potentially say, Hey, um, I, I'm really struggling with communicating with my mom, your mom, this person. Can you, can you support me in kind of holding this boundary or doing this communication. Um, maybe it's going to be um, supporting in finding that professional support, right? So taking that step to say, I'm going to find, you know, three, three folks who are on the directory that um, we can make some calls to, or that, you know, you can make calls to, to see if they're going to be good fit. So those are a few starting points. I think it's I think really a great suggestion. Oh, sorry. Awesome. Um, uh, Thanks. I, I think a great suggestion too for any, um, you know, non-feeding parent, if, if you're not like breastfeeding and uh, I, I think to open the dialogue for the new mother to say, whatever you decide, I support what, you know, whichever route you want to go. Because sometimes what I've seen too is you know, um, like a partner suggesting, well, let's, let's just do formula. And then that's perceived as like, well, you're not supporting me during breastfeeding or, you know, and, and then the other partner is saying like, well, let's keep trying at breastfeeding when all that mom wants is for her partner to say, can we just use formula? Can we just get on the same page and please like figure out a way and how we're feeding our baby. And so I think sometimes to leave that room for support, to simply say, let's, whatever you decide, I support, how can I help you in this way? And I think that that could be so meaningful and, and it gives the mom or the, you know, the feeding parent kind of that power back to say, this is what I want to do. And this is how I want to move forward. Um, and, and to really kind of take that um, ownership in, in that, in that regard. I like to remind couples to be so clear with each other because we often get into this thought thinking trap of my partner should just know they see me struggling. They see me crying in the middle of the night. I'm not sleeping. They should just know and our partners don't, and we can't read each other's minds. We don't know for sure. So it really has to become our job, which is to say, I really need you to take over bath time. I really need you to do the last feed before bedtime or ideally having this conversation. So for the people who are joining us today who are expecting to have this conversation ahead of time, what would it look like for your partner to support you? How do they, how, what signs will they see if you're struggling in a certain moment and know to step in for that? Or how could we have someone on call to come into our relationship and help us? I would also add, I think, um, and I think this comes from a, a loving, genuine place that a lot of partners, when they see um, their partner struggling, that there's a desire to fix it, right? Like A plus B equals C, just do this thing and you'll be okay, right? Because there's so, you know, because 
mental health is not on equal footing as physical health, right? We don't look at, you know, somebody who has debilitating anxiety and or depression and see it as we would somebody who has a broken leg or something of that nature, right? Mm -hmm. And so I think sometimes when, when women are really struggling, it's very difficult to be told, oh, just do this thing. Focus on the positive. You have such a happy, healthy baby. You're making too big of a deal out of this, right? These are not helpful things to hear. And sometimes what that mom needs is to be given the space and per permission to be struggling, right? And as a partner to say, I see you are in a lot of pain, right? To be curious about it. Tell me what it's like. What are you thinking? What are you feeling? And just to hold space for that and let it be. And then, and then figure out ways that you can be helpful. But a lot of times when you're drowning in that sea of depression and or anxiety, you're not, it's not a light switch, our mental health. We can't just turn it on and turn it off. Off. Um, and so to just join her where she's at, instead of telling her what to do that you think will help her feel better. A really, a really great point, Paige. I love that. And I've seen a really nice um, question in the Q and A that I'm going to ask. And I think, and I'm, and I'm hopeful that you guys will be able to answer this. And I know that you'll be able to answer this. You know, what type of title should the professional therapist hold? who to best help for postpartum specifically so what are what should people be looking for in the title of their therapist who's going to for someone who's going to be able to you know specialize in in um, postpartum issues one thing i want to briefly share on that too is i don't think it's so much the title or the degree that a licensed professional or licensed therapist holds that is you know a, a big importance i think it's more so is this individual trained and specialized in working with this specific population, right? Like you wouldn't go to your, um, you know, orthopedic surgeon for like heart surgery, right? And, and so I think you, in the same way, if you're looking for any type of provider, it's to make sure that they are trained in perinatal mental health, in PMADS, and that they have um, that, that training and kind of working with that population. The other thing we could look for would be around licensure. So is this an individual who is registered with a healthcare um, college in some way? So that could also be a good indicator. I would say for medication, um, this this is something that I think can be very important. Um, you know, in, in larger cities, um, reproductive psychiatrists are something that many people have heard of. Even here in New York City, there's a dearth of reproductive psychiatrists, yet they exist. Um, but in you know more rural suburban communities, um, there are not reproductive psychiatrists. Now we live in a, in a day and age now where virtual care is more and more available, which is good. Um, I say this because reproductive psychiatry is a very specialized level of psychiatry that's, that focuses on the perinatal period. It really focuses on everything from menses to menopause, but with a very specific um, focus on the perinatal period. So reproductive psychiatrists know what medications are safe and effective to take during pregnancy and in the postpartum and while breastfeeding, whereas general psychiatrists might not. Um, and to use, you know, Dr. Alice's example, like if you were to go to your PCP because you had a bulging disc, she wouldn't treat it there. She would send you to the orthopedic surgeon um, and, and think of reproductive psychiatry that way. It's, it's a psychiatrist that specializes in the reproductive period and has access to a lot more information and knowledge that pertains to medication safety and efficacy. And I think that while if someone's expecting, and even if you're postpartum and you're already in it, I think that this is still really a worthwhile venture is to identify some of these point people in your community um, before baby's here or ask your partner, hey, can you help me kind of identify or a support person? Can you help me identify these, these folks in my area, right? So um, a therapist or a couple of therapists, some um, um, support groups that are potentially in your area, um, a lactation consultant, a pelvic floor physical therapist, a reproductive psychiatrist, identifying these folks um, so that if you do need it, you're 
you're not like trying to struggle and, and, and find those folks, right? Even picking out a formula before a baby is here, because gosh, that moment when you're like, okay, we, we're going to supplement and you're standing. And I mean, I know now the there's not a ton of options and it's, that's what's so scary right now, but you know, the overwhelm of that decision, picking some of these things out and identifying these resources as, as soon as possible. Um, even a postpartum support person, like who is a friend or someone who's in a season of their life where if I reached out to them, they could support me um, in identifying right support um, or someone who can check in on me and letting them know, hey, can you be this person for me? Like, will you, will you check in on me? Like after baby's here, gosh, if someone asked me to take on that role, I would feel so honored. And I share that because I think a lot of times there is that sort of guilt of, I don't want to put that on anyone. I don't want to have to ask for help. But if someone that I cared about asked me, like if my sister-in-law or a friend asked me to be that person, I'd feel honored. Um, and so taking those steps to kind of have that, like support team in place, or at least knowing where to go. Mm, I love that. Um, and I've got a nice question in the chat that I want, to, that I'd love to get to. Um, and it's someone who is having their third baby. Um, and they're saying, you know, whilst these strategies all sound all well and good when you've got one baby, what about when I've got baby number three? You know, it's not that easy to say, get a dedicated block of sleep. So do you have any, you know, um, have any advice for people of, of multiple children? I can personally share that um, I've I've been a little more flexible on screen time with you know baby number two and um, managing that and, and really reducing kind of the guilt that I put on myself yeah. for you know not like showing up how I used to show up right and and really giving myself that compassion that says hey like the season of life that I'm in right now with this newborn and having another little one, mine are 17 months apart. And so it's, it's chaos around here, but I think really stepping back and giving myself that grace and saying, I, I'm doing like a phenomenal job, all things considered, you know, and really like helping and, and, and really nurturing myself in that way. It's speaking kindly to myself really helped and, and adjusting some of those expectations in terms of, you know, the guilt that I think surfaced for me personally in, doing things a certain way or adjusting and kind of refiguring out what my new normal, so to speak, look like. That's great, Alice. Um, anyone else want to jump in on that one? Sure. Yeah. I, so I have three kids. Um, and as I shared, my, my youngest um, is one and a half, almost two. Um, and she's sleeping through the night now, but there was that period of time I had her in the midst of the pandemic, um, with two older kids. And so we were not in a position at that time, um, to bring other people into our home to help with getting those chunks of sleep. And so what my partner and I, um, did because it's also a benefit also having a third is like, I also, like we knew we had some ideas of what, what to do based yeah. off the prior times. Um, and we both knew like sleep is key. Like if, if for both of us, sleep deprivation definitely triggered for me, anxiety triggers for him, depression. So we came up with a plan just between the two of us, um, where there would be certain nights where it was my night and then certain nights where it was his night where we were dedicating that chunk of sleep. And it really, I, I shared earplugs, um, eye mask earlier, and it really was because I needed to be able to tune out my senses while I trusted him to mm -hmm. take over. Um, and I didn't, I didn't need to micromanage. It might not to be done exactly how I would have done it. Um, but to give that to him while I slept in a space that was separate from our children um, with tuning out my senses so I could get that sleep. Um, now, um, because um, we are able to have more support in the home, um, I might actually have my older children sleep um, somewhere else one night if I had family around um, or have someone else come into the home so that him and I could both get sleep. But for, for me, it was really tuning out my senses um, allowing myself to recognize that I'm letting go of control. Um, and that might mean screen time, whatever's happening out there to make this happen. Because if I get this sleep, I'm gonna show up 
more aligned with the kind of mother that I want to be. I'm going to have more presence. It's going to be good for my mental health, which is going to be good for all of us. And so with that in mind, we move forward with that plan. Yeah, I love that, Cassidy. And I think and one of the one of the th things that I took away from your um, from from what you said is that prioritizing sleep um, for 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 parents and kids is so incredibly important when you've got those when you've got when you're adding you know when you're adding more kids I also have three three children three boys um and I you know and I know from you know from very personal experience that that the third honestly the third was actually a joy the other two were not but the third was it was really a dream and part of that was because the other two were sleeping you know the other two I prioritized the sleep of the older two you know so I knew that at 7 p.m I was done with those two children who were literally climbing the walls, you know, all day, every day. Um, but, and then I could, you know, and then I had sort of the energy and the time to sort of focus on the, the newborn and, or, you know, get that, you know, focus on, you know, getting that, getting that chunk of sleep. Um, but to your point, you know, you know, kind of what's, you know, when you have, you know, more, more than one child, you sort of know what's, what's coming. Nothing can prepare you for having, you know, many children but um you kind of know the deal you know that it, how bad it's going to be for you know for a short period of time and then you know that it's going to get better um you know fairly you know relatively quickly um but Paige I'd love you to sort of jump in on that to yeah. you know, to add to that well I think yeah like the second third time around what you have that you didn't have the first time around is perspective and perspective is such a powerful tool and I think it's why it's so difficult to become a parent for the first time, to become a mother for the first time, because we don't know how long, when, will it always be this way? Is it always going to yeah. be this hard? And when you go on to have your second or third, um, you ha it's, such a, it's such a superpower to be able to hold that truth. To your point, Natalie, I always say babies are like snowflakes. My children could not be more the polar opposite of each other if they tried. Um, and so, you know, just because one might be a good sleeper doesn't necessarily mean the next one will be. Um, but you do know that that things tend to have an expiration date. You know yeah. how long periods last. And I think that's a super helpful tool. I'm also going to say something that I know is going to go against the grain of what Natalie does <laughs> as a sleep expert. But like in those first few weeks, right, like do what works right? Like what, what it takes to get some sleep, especially after your body has gone through the rigorous process of giving birth, you know, to just, I if, completely agree with if that. There's, page. If there's a little <laughs> bit of rule breaking here and there, like it's okay. Just get totally. that sleep that you need to, to start to regain a little bit of energy and feel like yourself again. Totally. I love that. Um, okay, now we have just finished our poll, so thank you all for you know uh, for uh, for for submitting um, your answers to the poll, and I'm just going to go over a couple of the answers, and we asked you to tell us about your your mental health journey, um, and we have. Uh, 53% of you have experienced postpartum anxiety or postpartum depression. So thank you so much for sharing that with us, which is really, really uh, lovely and brave of you to share. Um, do you feel that parenting is isolating? And 95% of you said yes. And that's actually something that we didn't really talk about as much as perhaps we could have done. But, um, you know, we know that, you know, that parents feel incredibly isolated when they have when when they have their babies so um and it's something that you know we all of us you know want um parents to not be feeling um now so our next question da, da, da. do you know where to go to seek treatment for postpartum depression or anxiety and 65 percent of you said yes um and which is lovely. So, which is great. And hopefully we've been able to provide you with a couple of resources of places to go and things that you could and should be looking for. Um, and 30% um, and of you have said that you had sought treatment for postpartum depression or anxiety. Um, which, so thank you again for, for sharing that with us. Um, now, I'm wondering if anyone has any, you know, parting words or parting advice that they would like to give we're getting very close to time and I just wanted to give you know all of the panelists a chance to sort of to say something before before we wrap up 
I just wanted to share that this sort of sentiment that I think um, someone from Manage just shared in the chat that you're not you're not alone. Like look, look at this data, right? I know that one of the things that shame does when shame whispers in my ear, it's like there's something wrong with you. Don't let anyone see that. And it makes me want to like close in, isolate, hide that part of myself. I wouldn't dare share that with my partner, with a professional. Like, no. But I think that if we begin to sort of see these numbers and come to these sort of things, I'm so glad you're all here and begin to actually take in the message that I'm not alone. Like this is a thing, there's a name for it. I think that shame, I know the research shows shame can't fester and grow in that kind of environment of connection and feeling like we're supported and we're not alone in this experience. And so we can whisper back to shame, no, there isn't something wrong with me. Like I, I'm, I'm struggling because this is hard and I am worthy of support. And so yeah. then, and we want to normalize these feelings and normalize this, this whole experience. Um, yeah. So thank you yeah. so much for sharing that Cassidy. I love it. I would add that if you are on the fence about seeing your provider, a provider for medication, or you're considering therapy, you know, starting individual therapy or group therapy, um, I don't wait, you know, if, if you're thinking about it, I say, go for it. And I encourage you to, I mean, I highly recommend that you, you do it. So that's, that's what I have to share. Love it, Alice. Love it. Tracy. I would encourage you to just remember that what's happening in your relationship is a season and it's going to change and it's okay. If sex is on the back burner, please do not take the six week mark with your OBGYN or physician that this is some kind of clearing for sex that it's okay if you're waiting longer it's okay if it's on the back burner you will find your way back to each other and in the meantime keep reassuring each other keep sharing what's hard and what you need and asking for help love it love it thank you and Paige uh, I would just say that with treatment everyone can feel better um, and, you know, as Dr. Alice was saying, whether it's therapy or therapy and medication um, or a higher level of care, treatment works. Uh, and you deserve to feel better. You deserve to, uh, to enjoy your motherhood and your parenthood journey. Um, and it's okay to need help. Um, and even if you do start therapy or go on medication, it doesn't mean it's going to be a forever thing. It means that it's something you need right now to help you feel better and make it to the other side. I love it. Love it. Thank you, Paige. Thank you, everybody. Um, I'm so, so grateful for this conversation and for all of you, you know, joining us this evening. I hope that all of the, um, the participants, I know that all of the participants learnt learned a lot and I'm so grateful for all of your, your wisdom and advice. Um, and I think everybody's uh, bios are in the emails and follow-up emails that we will be sending. So you feel free to reach out um, to any of these amazing panelists if you needed any of their help and support. And also, you know, we, are, we post, have posted in the chat information about um, uh, PSI and, and there'll be a couple of other resources going out to you as well. So, but thank you all so, so much for joining us and enjoy the rest of your evenings and enjoy those beautiful babies and beautiful families. And um, we will see you next time. Thank you. Bye.